Hey everybody, this is Avi Abelo from IsraelUnwired.com here in our ancestral and eternal homeland, the land of Israel, in our undivided capital, Jerusalem, with once again, blessed to have in studio, Jeremy Sultan, political strategist. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you, Avi. It's great to be with you again. It, uh, listen, I got great feedback last time you were in, so I thought this is so a... Uh, good I'm glad. <laughs> and uh, post-ceasefire, plenty of... Plenty of balls up in the air regarding the security situation, regarding uh, the political situation. Uh, co- you're, you're now in a new position, sort of, because uh, well, the head of your party is now defense minister. That's a big change since last time we, we were sitting together. <laughs> it's It's been quite a week. I mean, I, I'm still doing the same stuff I was doing beforehand. But, but yes, uh, we're here Thursday night. Last Thursday night um, was a very, very different time than, than today. Uh, Friday morning, uh, the Prime Minister decided to offer the position of Defense Minister Naftali Bennett. And, uh, of course, that was uh, a surprising development for a lot of people. And uh, he accepted it on Friday. It was ready, um, I think, first leaked uh, during that time that's like after Shabbat, but within the 18 minutes before Shabbat. So some people knew about it and some people didn't know about it. Which and one were then, you? Uh, well, 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 well um, I'm a, I, I, I knew about it on Friday, but, um, but, but some people only found out about that on Saturday night. Wow. Uh, my understanding, I didn't watch, it, but, but that, was the, uh, that was the main topic of discussion on Friday night, of course, on, on all of the television stations. Uh, on Sunday, it passed in a cabinet vote, and then uh, Tuesday at 11 a.m., uh, Naftali officially became defense minister and got a new office on the 14th floor of the Kiryat. And, uh, of course, earlier on Tuesday, <laughs> in the middle of the night between Monday and Tuesday, there were uh, two uh, interesting events. One was a strike in Syria, and the other one was a strike... Which has that, gotten very little attention. That's true. It yeah, has, interestingly. It, it, it has gotten a lot of little attention. Uh, maybe that's because Syria did not fire back. <laughs> I guess so. But, but but again, when when the uh, when the target is Islam Jihad and not you know uh, Assad or some of the other bigger groups there, right. uh, so, so I guess it's not such a big surprise. Um, but but of course, the one that people are talking about is the one that led to what we've been dealing with for the last uh, now. Uh, uh, cl- it was close to forty eight hours. We're ready um, at a point where we have a ceasefire. Hopefully, it will hold. Um, and that is, of course, the situation of taking out the leader of the Islamic Jihad in the Gaza Strip. And that was, of course, a very, very big success. And um, they decided to respond as we expected. Uh, we already preemptively uh, made the decision to cancel schools um, in uh, all of the areas right. in the Gaza periphery, uh, the western Negev, and uh, going up all the way towards Tel Aviv. And uh, we had a uh, parade of rockets, if we're going to use a more diplomatic term. And uh, I think the final count was about 350. They're saying f- more than 450 more, officially. More yeah, that's the official, that. the official IDF information is 450 plus rockets. So, so there you go. It's, uh, it's a lot of rockets. It's uh, An average of one every seven minutes over the two days. And there you go. And as we know, they usually try to set them out. Uh, so you have a bunch of time to try to challenge the Iron Dome. And thank God we have zero uh, fatalities right. on the Israeli side. Right. And uh, we're looking at 25 Islamic jihadists that we were able to eliminate during this uh, mission. Uh, this is a good opportunity for us to take out a lot of their leadership. We're able to take out terrorists that were in the process of firing rockets. Um, a very, very good success. But definitely, uh, if we're looking back at last week and this week, there's a very big change between last week and where we're sitting today right now. I mean, uh, first of all, for those of you unfamiliar, again, uh, Jeremy works with the Amin HaChadash party with Naftali Bennett and Ayala Chaked. So last time we were sitting together, uh, uh, Naftali Bennett was not the defense minister, and now he is, which is really the second most important position second only to the prime minister in Israeli politics. So he's connected to important people. He is an important person himself, but now all of a sudden, on a serious note, seriously, you're, you know, uh, connected to the defense minister. Um, and were you, were you just as surprised with the development that he was asked by 
Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to be the defense minister? You know, a lot of people asked me uh, because there were junior portfolios that were offered to him in the past. And Aftali said, no, I, I'm not going to join the government for that. And that made a lot of sense uh, at the time. A lot of people were a little puzzled about why it was that he would not take it. It's, um, it's surprising, but it's also not surprising. It's surprising because Netanyahu has for many years uh, tried to prevent Netanyahu, um, prevent Bennett from getting the defense ministry. Just a year ago, that was an ultimatum of Bennett's. A year ago was an ultimatum of Bennett's. Um, for those who might not be aware, uh, before the 2015 election, uh, there was a commitment made by Netanyahu uh, to Bennett to appoint him as defense minister. And that was a commitment that Netanyahu did not live up to. And uh, a big reason of why Bennett did not campaign against Liku trying to um, take a straw and sip up his votes was because he thought that he had the defense ministry waiting for him. It turns out that Netanyahu took both his seats and uh, the opportunity for the defense ministry. Uh, after Lieberman left the defense ministry, which was back in October, I believe, it was the day after the second mayoral race um, of the municipal elections that we had. Um, so so there was a situation of w- what are we going to do with the defense ministry? Now, ever knows, last year it has been vacant, but at the time, Bennett said, we need a full-time defense minister. Mm-hmm. And this was a position that he had. And uh, a lot of people agreed with that position. They might not have agreed that uh, they wanted to see Bennett there. But even in the opposition, we had a lot of people that said, it would be dangerous for us to go out and do an operation or go into a war without having a full-time defense minister. It's important to have someone there. And we found ourselves in this position where there was an ultimatum that was made, and uh, Netanyahu decided that uh, he was not going to appoint Bennett. Bennett decided to put the good of the country first and said that he would stay in the coalition and he would not uh, go through with the threat of the ultimatum, which was that he would resign from the government. And then Netanyahu decided a couple weeks later anyways uh, to to quote Bennett and say that we're going to a new election, uh, at which point Bennett decided to uh, campaign for the defense ministry. And a very big part of that April election was um, auditioning for that job. Of course, uh, I mean, Haddad should not pass the threshold. And um, following that, Netanyahu even went as far as firing him from the education ministry. Um, and in the election that we did have uh, most recently in September, uh, Naftali decided not to directly campaign for defense minister. If anything, um, he talked a lot as someone who was with him a lot on the campaign trail. He talked a lot about security issues, but he, he focused more on economic issues. Um, a lot of people said it looked like he was auditioning for the finance ministry position, um, something that, of course, um, uh, hit a few nerves with Moshe Kahlon and the Kulanu people. And uh, as a result of all that, uh, we ended up in a situation where we got uh, seven seats with the Amina Alliance. And uh, there's not yet been a government because no one's been able to form one. But it's no secret that, like I said, uh, that this has been a position that Naftali's talked about for years. A very good part of the last year, we've been talking about the fact that uh, Naftali wants to sit there. And when Netanyahu decided uh, a week ago tomorrow, on Friday, to to call in uh, Naftali and say, I want to offer you um, really what is, you know, for all practical purposes, it's it's the deputy prime minister position, not in title, but in practice, uh, the most important position to be in charge of the IDF and the defense forces. Uh, Naftali went ahead and said, you know, it's true that I said that I'm not going to go ahead and take a junior portfolio just for a short period of time, but I would be a hypocrite if I've said consistently for the last year we need a full-time defense minister, the position's being offered to me, and I'm not going to take it. So he went ahead and he took it, and we are where we are now, where he took it um, at the time not realizing that 10 days beforehand, uh, there was already authorization made by the security cabinet. This is important what you're saying because yes. some media outlets were, were saying, oh, Bennett's already pressing buttons and trying to make a difference, and it's all his fault. So so, so 10 days before um, he was appointed, um, the, the security cabinet already made a decision right. that they were going to go forward with um, the assassination of the Islamic the precision Jihad attack, leader. right. And uh, what was... What was decided is that they would wait for the right timing. And they didn't know exactly when that was going to be, but they knew that they now had 
a a um, a green light to move forward when the opportunity would arise. And ju- just to cut in for a second, mm-hmm. people have to understand so much intelligence is, yes. ne- is needed. It takes weeks, if not months, to get the intelligence of where a terrorist is going to be, if he's going to be in which apartment, which room, because this precision, they actually got him in his bedroom. So it, it's a lot of planning. It's not just, sure. all right, let's do it now. No, a lot, a lot of planning. Uh, again, it's because a lot of times you do know where he is, but he's shielding himself with a lot of um, you know children around him or situation where you're trying to avoid the collateral damage aspect uh, to the most that you can. Also, you want to do it when it makes sense for you, meaning to do it in the middle of the night is is uh, really good because you're able to prepare yourself for response and you're in a situation where it's going to take more time for the other side to scramble. It's going to take time for word to, to get out. Also, um, there are additional aspects I'm not going to get into, but the, there are additional advantages uh, also on the intelligence side when you go ahead and, and you decide to move at night. So we end up in a situation where um, this decision was made. This operation. And yeah. I'm sure N- Netanyahu is sitting there and he's saying, well, I don't have a defense minister. Mm. And um, <laughs> this might not necessarily look good. I mean, you, you know, a lot of people have been very cynical about this appointment, but imagine us going through and forward with this operation without a defense minister. Imagine the criticism that we would hear from Gantz, from the left, from a lot of people within the media. They would say it's not healthy for Netanyahu to be both <clears throat> defense minister and prime minister. It would be helpful to have another person mm-hmm. around the table. Um, so um, even before he took uh, the position on Tuesday, ready Sunday, he started with consultations. He was brought up to speed on you know, everything that, that needed to be um, you know, because we, we have this interesting situation in Israel where you have a 48-hour period in which uh, you have this transfer of power. So, you know, with the appointment on Sunday of, of Bennett by the cabinet, Netanyahu actually had to submit his resignation letter, you know, right. the resignation letter <laughs> of defense minister. And uh, you have the 48 hours in which um, you need to have the new guy uh, learn the ropes and the old guy also do his job um, to sort of pass over the football um, in terms of everything that goes along with that. Uh, one of the interesting things that also happened is that um, until recently, Rabbi Eli Ben Dahan was the deputy defense minister. He lost his seat in the last election. He was replaced last month by Avi Dichter. Right. And uh, according to Israeli law, when the minister resigns, the deputy also resigns. So Avi Dichter <laughs> was automatically. Um, out of a job just as um, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu you know, resigned. Netanyahu resigned. Um, so, so a lot of people asked, was you know the first thing that, that Bennett did? Well, first thing he did was make sure to reappoint you know Dichter, Dichter as the deputy minister, um, and, and that's an important job. I know that, that in the past there have been a lot of people who have uh, also mocked a lot of these positions. Um, in general, the deputy defense minister really gets. Is you know it's delegated to him a certain area and sphere that he's supposed to deal with, and what Dichter was given was to deal with the home front and to make sure that we're prepared. Right, which is critical within our wars because our wars, the home front is where, where the battlefield is. You know, a, a lot of times you're thinking when you're trying to make a decision strategically what you're going to do right now to deal with an issue, you need to figure out what you want to be doing doing with your civilians to protect them. Right. And a lot of times it helps to delegate that. In the past, and this was actually done within the second Netanyahu government, um, back in the 2009 to 2013 uh, government, it was actually a separate ministry. It was called the Home Front Ministry. Right. Um, and uh, ironically, the first one I think that actually held that was Avi Dichter. Really? So um, oh, yeah. it is quite. It, it was quite interesting for me to see how that stuff go. You know, but um, you, you do have a situation where you have a lot of people who are in positions right now that are dealing with the various issues. You, of course, have oversight um, by the Defense and Foreign Affairs Committee chairman. The new one is uh, Gabi Ashkenazi <laughs> from Blue and White. Right. So, so he's getting a lot of security consultations. He was also brought in um, for a lot of these things. Um, but, but, but it's very, very different. You know, like, imagine the situation, like I said, where Netanyahu does not appoint Bennett. And um, Dichter is not given a specific job to deal with the home front. And Ashkenazi is not given the opportunity to, uh, as, as a member of the opposition, to understand what's happening, but also in his job of oversight, of making sure that the legislative branch, our Knesset, 
you know, uh, for, for all practical purposes, you know, the Congress, uh, you know, the oversight. Venezuela, yes, you, you want to make sure that all <laughs> these checks and balances are working. Right. And one of the big criticisms that, that I've seen within the, uh, unfortunately, with a lot of the anti-Israeli media, is them trying to present this as a very, very different situation where this is, uh, you know, either, like you said, Bennett pushing buttons, or uh, this is Netanyahu's war, or this it was all done for political reasons, or this is a last minute, you know, ditch effort. Um, what we've seen is that this is something that was planned ahead of time. You have a lot of serious people who disagree on various issues, who are all sitting around the table, um, you have full oversight. It's, it's just like you have um, any operation that's going on in any other democracy, that, that's the same stuff that we're doing here. Right. So um, let me ask you, from the, from the political angle, mm -hmm. we just finished a 48-hour conflict with Gaza, 450-plus rockets falling on the home front. Right. 25 Islamic Jihad leaders were taken out, but we, we all know Hamas is still in power. Hamas is more powerful than, than yeah. Islamic Jihad, meaning we, we all... Th this battle was finished for now, mm -hmm. and it's waiting for the next, th the next round, unfortunately, even though we all want it to be over already and no threats anymore. For so, sure. so the question then is, like, what do you think politically? What would, what are now the ramifications in terms of a potential government, in terms of uh, continuing to the extra twenty one days, uh, narrow right government? If we go to third elections, is this going to hurt Netanyahu and the right and Bennett as defense minister, or are they going to be able to play it up and 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 and, and grow from 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 this? Politically, because of how they successfully dealt with this, love to hear your your thoughts. Sure, I mean, you know, last time I was here, I said you have three options, right? You have that uh, the option of Gantz uh, figuring out a way to to form with the mandate, you know, by him. You have the third mandate option, and you have third elections. And uh, we're now at a situation where we're uh, six days away. Right, already next week on Wednesday, the, the buzzer goes off for, for, for Gantz. He no longer has the mandate, and that automatically triggers the 21 days, and we talked about that last time. Right. I don't see Gantz being able to do much in these uh, six days. I really do think we're going to go to the 21. Um, look, we, we saw a situation where we saw members of the Arab joint list go out uh, to the streets criticize the IDF, um, criticize the government, criticize not just Netanyahu, but um, in general, the, the, the idea of um, targeted killings, the idea of um, uh, taking out Islamic Jihad leaders, the idea of uh, trying to influence what is happening right now in the Gaza Strip. And, you know, Benny Gantz is a former IDF chief of staff. And he's sitting there with two other former IDF chief of staff right. with, uh, with Yalon and Ashkenazi. And, and as much as they're trying to, you know, say, look, we have an opportunity to make a uh, coalition in which, um, again, they're not expecting they'll be a part of the coalition, but from the outside, they'll Support. be the security net of the Arab parties. Uh, I think it's quite clear after this operation that that's not something that's going to fly. And, mean, so it can't be used as a, as, a, as a political threat against Netanyahu or the, or the right in terms of uh, trying you know, to get their it, way. It, it's not even shooting blanks. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gun that has no bullets. It's, it's an unloaded gun. I, I mean, this is, it, it's quite ridiculous. It's a water gun. Um, I heard Ofer Shelach, uh, who's a member of Blue and White. Uh, he's from the Yeshatid party, but, but a member of Blue and White. And um, I think he's actually number uh, three on the Lapid list. And he was actually saying that, um, well, first of all, he was saying there's not going to be a national unity government. He said um, the chances of that are, is pretty much nil. And then he refused to rule out uh, this idea. Of, of, a, of, of a government with the yes. support of the joint Arab list. And, and, and then I, you know, suddenly you have uh, all these situations where you have uh, sources in blue and white, you know, you, you know, going ahead and negating whatever. But I think U.S. Hendel said. went one public saying there's yeah. no way. I mean, again, you have Telem, which is definitely the most right wing of the three components right. of the Blue and White Party, um, and, and they're very clear in their position there. But, but again, you know, the main the main outcome politically from this situation is the the threat, which, like <laughs> I said, I've never really thought of it to be such a realistic one. It's a great talking point, 
but realistically, um, it, it, it's just not something that makes a lot of sense. It makes even less sense now. And uh, if the ceasefire does not hold <laughs> and this continues, it's going to make even less sense. And um, besides those issues, and I think I mentioned this last time also, um, the idea that they would be able to pass a state budget in a minority government is very unlikely. Right. And that means um, it, if no one manages to get the signatures in the 21 days, we have elections in March. Right. If someone does manage to get the 21 days, but the third mandate itself is unsuccessful, we have elections in April. If somehow within these six days, uh, Gantz is able to form a, a minority government, so he's not able to pass the budget, we have elections in June. <laughs> um, Any so, way you so, look <laughs> at it, there's elections soon, un un unless there's a joint uh, un national unity government. Unless there's a national unity government. So if I said there are three different ways that, we, that, that we're looking at, the second mandate, the third mandate, or the third election, so here the three options are the national unity government, the left minority government, and the right minority government. And I've already explained why out of the three, the, the left minority government is the least likely to happen. And that's because the ceiling on it is that March 31st, the deadline of passing a budget passes, which triggers an automatic snap election right. um, within 84 to 90 days. And we have, like I said, elections in June. A minority right wing government is a possibility. It's also not very likely. Right. It requires Lieberman to stay outside of the coalition, but to support from the outside. Each time there would be a concession given on religion and state issues. Uh, perhaps the first one that would happen is that uh, the Haredim would agree to the draft bill as Lieberman wants. As a result, Lieberman would um, help out on the confidence um, motion to form a government. It could be that we would be looking at budget cuts um, to certain sectors within the Haredim since anyways the next budget is going to be a tough one to pass because we need to make some cuts on spending. It could be Lieberman is able to help out with that budget if he sees those things. But, but even then, you know, we're looking at a situation where we'll get to the same position where we're a year later and we're instead of being in June 2020, we're in June 2021 and then we're probably going to be in elections right there. Because it's just not, you've never had a situation in which you've had two consecutive budgets passed when there is no majority government. Mm -hmm. I mean, a minority government has never been able to, to pass two consecutive budgets together. So I, I don't think this is going to be the first time in history that that happens. So, so again, it's a bit longer of a shelf life, you know, an additional year, potentially, compared to the left minority government, but it also requires uh, compromises from the Haredim, which is difficult, and it doesn't really help you so much. A and then the option of the national unity government is one that is really what brings the most stability. The last time Israel had a full Knesset term without any early elections was the right. Knesset of, of 84 to 88, right. where you, you had a rotation, both for prime minister, but a national unity government in place. So, so, so that's what we can do again. And that's the only way to really avoid having elections within the next year, year and a half. If we don't have a national unity government, then we will go to an election. Will it be in March? Will it be in April? Right. Will it be in June? Um, I don't know. But uh, right now, unfortunately, Israel is very divided. However, if we do see a minority government, <laughs> I'm sure when we do get around to, to the next elections, uh, that will be a very big talking point for both sides moving forward. And your thoughts in terms of the, the uh, implications of this co Gaza conflict on a potential third election if it happens because nothing's yeah. able to be made? I, I mean, usually when these type of things happen, it's good for the right. Uh, we remember 96 where Paris was leading in the polls, um, there was some terror in the streets. Netanyahu was able to edge out a, a victory by, I think it was, uh, it was less than 20,000 votes. I don't remember if it was, you know, yeah, 18 the middle or, or 19,000. But, but, but he won by less than 20,000 <clears> votes. That's, that's a very, very narrow margin. Um, we've seen this also, you know, uh, with, with the second intifada. Um, uh, it, it broke out during uh, Hud Barak's uh, term in the 2001 election. Sharon was able to defeat uh, Barack quite handedly. Um, Sharon used to be a, a persona non grata. <laughs> Suddenly he's able to completely knock out 
Barack, who was um, not just you know the, the prime minister, but a former IDF chief of staff, former defense minister, a person who was very much um, expected to be um, a leader for many years to come. So whenever you do have a situation like this, voters do move more, more to the right. Um, when you have this situation as we have now, where um, you have the center or the left wing candidate, or in this you know situation, the center left candidate um, sitting, you know, we talked before last time about that picture of the coalition talks with with Gantz in the middle and Ayman Oda and Ahmed Tibi right. to his sides. That would be the main election campaign <laughs> for the Likud. But you know what worry? You know what worries me, and it's a real worry. Yeah, that the public's knowledge of even recent history is nil, right? You're right. And all of a sudden, when you have a Benny Gantz and a Yair Lapid attacking Netanyahu and Bennett from the right, saying, you didn't take care of this, and it's going to happen again, and the people down south are saying, we're sick of this, we know it's going to happen again, even though it's with the left policies that caused this disastrous situation we are in, and... And Netanyahu is trying to get herself out of it because of a very complicated uh, geopolitical situation. We have elections, and Benny Gantz and Yair Lapid are able to, to convince many people. Like, yeah, Netanyahu had a chance, he had all these years, and Bennett was defense minister, and it's still a problem, and, and rockets from Gaza are still a problem. So stop, stop supporting the right. They talk tough, but they're not doing the job. Finally, let us do it. Well, we know that that's not going to be the case. Right. I mean, accountability is something that I would like to see more in Israeli politics. I mean, w one of the arguments that, that, that we had um, against Likud, not just in the last election, but, but in all the elections going back to the disengagement, is that you're looking at uh, senior ministers, uh, the foreign minister Israel Katz, Yuval mm -hmm. Steinitz, Tzach Yanegbi. Uh, I, I mean, you're looking at the Likud guys, and they voted for the disengagement, right. meaning their, their position back in 2005 was no different than the position of the people in blue and white. Um, the, the, the only major, you know, uh, differences you can say is that they were outside of the Knesset, but Yair Lapid was writing for it. Um, Benny Gantz was pushing for it within the IDF ranks. Um, you know, Ashkenazi was, was, of course, pushing for it from already a more senior position. But, uh, you know, that's a situation that, it, that, that you have now. Like I said, what does happen is Israelis do have a very short memory span. So if the last thing they're thinking about is the most recent event, which in this case is uh, the last Gaza um, round, again, you, th they can go ahead and say, well, we, we didn't like what we, what we saw there. But again, you're looking at 25 dead Islamic jihadists. You're looking at zero dead Israelis. You're looking at a situation where we actually, for the first time in a long time, went back to targeted killings. We went back to taking out the bad guys. When you have the type of rhetoric which we've heard uh, coming from the Israeli side, which is very different than you know previous times, um, it, it's very possible the deterrence we're going to see after this round. And again, we're hopeful the ceasefire you know holds and that this doesn't extend down the line, but. You know, assuming the ceasefire does hold, the way to build up his deterrence and to keep it is to make sure that every time they try to change the rules of the game, and each time they try to go ahead and um, tempt us, that we do actually respond. I think one of the biggest pieces of criticism that we've heard against the right-wing governments is that in the, uh, what you call, campaign between campaigns, when you have uh, a time in between two operations, that there's not been um, a clear price, meaning uh, the enemy would go ahead and you know uh, send out rockets, and um, l l let's look at some of the, the 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 responses that came out from the IDF spokesman. One time it was um, lightning that set off the, um, the, the the rockets from Gaza. Right. One time it was... Like giving, um, giving excuses yeah. for not, not to not for Israel to go on the offensive and, and make them pay a price for for shooting at us. Right, you know... I, or if it was just shooting empty, empty, like, empty locations. Empty locations is also another example, but... But but I was I was going specifically to you okay. know some of some of these things. But that's another good example. But you know uh, uh, basically the idea was well it was done by mistake so therefore we don't have to do anything. Um, Israel's going to be judged right now 
on what they respond to after we finish this current round and how we act in the campaign between campaigns. And real deterrence means that after a few times where they test us and we show them that we're serious, that they're going to think twice before going ahead and uh, starting another uh, uh, rain parade party on uh, the Western Negev. So we're, we're again hopeful that, that that is going to be the type of stuff we see. When we do hear things, uh, you know, Defense Minister Bennett said, um, we want the leaders of Islam Jihad to know that if they order an attack in the day, that they're not going to be able to make it through the night. Meaning, you, you want the leaders to now understand that, although in past rounds we've kept the leadership out of it, that the leadership is fair game if they're going to keep going ahead and right. uh, moving forward with these, these uh, attacks. So, so these are the type of things that are going to be important when we find ourselves in front of another election. Um, what is going to be happening in that week, two weeks, even three weeks, before we go to an election? Is it going to be in a situation where Israel was tested and Israel responded? Or did Israel not respond? Were we in a situation in which um, someone paid a price for their bad decision to attack us? Or in a situation where they got away with it? As long as we're able to enact actual right-wing policies, I do think the majority of the Israeli public will gravitate <clears throat> to the right. But all that being said, you would hope that regardless of an election, regardless of, of politics, that that should be the policy. And my feeling is, is that regardless of an election, that is what needs to be done. And assuming we do have a national unity government, I would be very hopeful we would move forward with that. Um, those are the type of things that could be difficult if you have a situation where Lapid and Yalon and Ashkenazi and Gantz say, listen, uh, we, we don't think we need to respond to every rocket. We don't think that we need to take out the leadership. Um, we don't think that we need to create a situation where the other side uh, is going to think twice before responding. We should leave ourselves um, some room to operate. So, you know, uh, th there's always people like to talk about the um, difference between what someone says before they're in the position of power and then and when, they're when, in the when they are. And, and I do think that when you're looking at a situation where we have now, where you have a new defense minister, you have, again, relatively a new you know deputy defense minister, you have a new person in charge of oversight <laughs> that is the member of the party that is trying to um, become the next government also, um, that you have a lot of new blood in there that that already uh, two months ago uh, you, you didn't you have three new people in in, right. in three new very crucial positions so for sure Netanyahu is is the constant and you know <laughs> if there's one thing we've learned in Israeli <laughs> politics is that Netanyahu is usually the constant um, but if you're looking at the people in the key positions around him they're different if you look at the fact that Kohavi uh, the new IDF chief of staff this is the first major operation that he's going with. Um, I also like his name choice. I don't know if you saw the name choice for the current campaign is Black Belt. Oh, yes. Yeah. Why, why do you like his name choice? <laughs> I, I, I like ones that, 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 you know, in the past we've seen people who, who've taken more defensive words. Uh, you know, and so there's more. Black Belt, he's, you know, like Israel means it's, business. It, it sends a certain message, I feel, when, when you have that instead of protective edge or defensive shield. Um, w when you're going ahead and taking one in which you're showing the other side that you actually mean business, <laughs> black belt, like... No, 100%. You know? I was actually going to bring up that point. Yes. And, and uh, as, as, as a very positive development, spe specifically Kohavi's app appointment as the chief of staff. But I want to, I want to preface it with, uh, with a point that mo most people do not reflect upon. It doesn't get mm -hmm. talked about. Because, again... People look at the record of a Bibi Netanyahu right wing government for years. Right. Then you say, well, well, why did these fake operations take place under the right wing government? And many people don't understand that it's not just the prime minister who decides. It's not just the defense minister, the defense minister who decides. The biggest example is Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu a number of years ago under when 
President Barack Obama was president, yeah. he decided to attack Iran, and it was people, leaders within the military defense establishment in Israel right. who stopped that operation. So in that the, even, if, even if a prime minister or a defense minister want to do something, if the top echelons have enough votes within the establishment, they can do what they want. And therefore, the positive appointment of Kohavi. He is the first chief of staff the Israeli army has who talks with the perspective of, no, we're an army to win. Right. And that's exactly the point you were making. And that 100%. falls good timing for Bennett to be defense minister, to have a chief of staff who, from what it seems, is the first one in many years yes. who finally has the right perspective of what it is to be the Israeli army. We're not here to just do protective edge. We are here to get after our, our enemies and stop them as much as possible within geopolitical link, and not to sit back and make excuses of why we can't do things, which is what the defense establishment was doing for many years, which can be the place where blame can be put, that it's not because you mean Netanyahu didn't want to do something, or right. Lieberman even didn't want to do something, it was because the establishment did not let them do what they wanted to do. And now we have today's situation. Yeah, I mean, uh, when I think of black belt, I think of kicking butt, right? You know, karate. Like, you know, the, it's a good people, point. people and, and I do have a lot of friends that, that served under Kojavi, you know, and the paratroopers. Um, he, he's a guy who, who kicked butt during his his time. So, so again, I think it's a very good name. Um, I do agree with you that I think that he's he's a lot more of an assertive IDF chief of staff. I thought it was an amazing choice. I remember when they were going in, they were talking about the final like four or five candidates. I was like, I hope they choose Kojavi, but they probably won't because whenever they're they're coming to the last few candidates, um, there's always the one that I like, and, and they never choose that one. Uh, a lot of times it was the one that I served under, or you know, was a few uh, under me. I'm already in a situation where I have um, two former uh, commanders of mine that are now major generals in the Matkal. Wow. Um, you know, which ages me, but ages them a lot more. <laughs> so, you know, it's um, it's it's nice to see it's nice to see a situation where again the IDF says we want to win. Uh, in terms of defense strategy, I, I think an important thing to, to talk about here is that you know to bring it back also to one of your previous points. As a politician, sometimes um, you, you're you're looking for for one of two different things from from the uh, people under you, and this is the same thing in the army. One is to get, give you all the options, so that you're able to go ahead and decide what it is that you want to do, and the other one is sometimes you want to have limited options. Now, what you have that's an issue is when the uh, person who's under you who is not on the political side, decides on the professional side to limit the options for you and say that this is your full array of options. And what we did see in the past is a lot of members of the defense establishment try to, you know, go to the security cabinet, go to the defense minister, go to the prime minister and say, um, these are your only options. When in reality they were the ones that predetermined which options would be brought up, right. and there was there was a much uh, larger array. Um, another issue, and you know that goes back to the point that you know, and uh, it's been disclosed with you know stuff that was done with Mayor Dagan and so forth. That um, a lot of times you say, "I am giving a directive to the army. This option doesn't exist. Create this option for me." And then uh, the response, instead of trying to make that option happen, is, um, well, we, we just don't have the capability to do that. Meaning the response comes that, um, I remember when you ordered that a year ago or two years ago, but I just never did anything with that because that's not possible. Whereas the political side thinks the professional side is working on additional option, and, and then that isn't actually happening. Mm -hmm. So when you do have a situation where you have the head of the IDF chief of staff who is a winner and someone who wants to kick butt and you have an opportunity now you know a lot of people are asking me what are some of the things that Bennett can do if he's only in there um, for less than two months uh, which question. would be which would be a situation uh, that, that, that could happen if we do have a new government meaning um, the longest that he would be able to stay in the position assuming we don't have new elections is is um, from the minute from the minute of the announcement till the minute of the screening of the next person, if you stretch it out completely, it's 58 days. 
um, one of the things you can do is there's a lot of appointments that have been waiting for approval. approval. Uh. And this is an opportunity to promote a lot of winners, a lot of people who are looking to kick butt. And because there's been no full-time defense minister for the last year, and the prime minister has been dealing with a lot of things, there has been a backlog of things that need wow, requirements. Wow, that's big. They need appointments. So this is a very, very big opportunity to go ahead and put in some really good winners in a lot of these positions. Right. And again, someone, I've, I mean, I don't know the, the, the personalities, but I do follow up on these issues. And unfortunately, even in the Israeli army that you'd think they're all winners, People are approved because they're many times they're yes men and they do not take risks. And those that are the risk takers who have the potential to really win are passed over and do not end up going up. For instance, like Ofer Winter, he was one of those people. Well, you know what you know what his job is right now. What's his job right now? His job right now is he's the uh, attaché to the defense minister. Right. So you know. Uh, for the for, for people who don't know, uh, Winter and Bennett served uh, previously together, and uh, they have a good working relationship uh, before this. Uh, but, but as defense minister, I don't think you can ask for better uh, military attaché as someone that you actually served with. And, and this brings me to another point, which I haven't seen a lot of coverage about. Um, I don't know if you're even aware, aware of this, but Naftali Bennett is the youngest defense minister ever appointed. No! Yes, he's uh, 47 years old. Wow. So he's the youngest appointee ever. Wow. And beyond that, um, he served with a, a great amount, you know, a great deal of the people th that are around the table. So when he's sitting there with all the major They're generals... Uh, They're all so, fighting buddies, you in know, a sense. So, so, again, some of them might be old foes, but, okay. <laughs> but, but you know, certainly there are some, some old friends there. But, but meaning when he's sitting there and he's listening to each person around the table, um, a lot of them are from his generation, and he's in a situation where he actually has previous experiences. You, you have reference points that you can go back to. Um, a lot of people said, you know, it takes time to get into the position, but this is a situation where the defense minister knows, um, I don't want to say virtually everyone personally, but a great portion of the people he's working with on a day-to-day -day basis, certainly, of course, his own defense uh, ministry at um, uh, these These are, the, there are a lot of people he served with. Um, yeah, he was never an IDF chief of staff, but Bennett did serve in Sarat Matkal. He was a brigade commander, you know. He, 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 you know, was in a lot of positions within the IDF, and now he has an opportunity to know the people around the table who are right. giving him advice and perhaps also know um, the right follow-up questions to ask or the right options or uh, think of a scenario where he can say, uh, do you remember what we did in Lebanon in 96? Can we do that here? Mm -hmm. um, yes, when you have IDF chief of staff um, who become defense ministers, they have that ability. The issue that you usually have with that situation is by the time they do become defense minister, it's been a few generations, and the people who are all around them are completely new. Uh, times have changed, and a lot of times uh, you'll have a defense minister who's now you know, 10 years retired or 15 years retired, and he's trying to uh, impose a lot of old views on, on a you know, relatively you know, a younger group that, that has experience from today right. and not from 15 years ago. Uh, Especially with today's technology, uh, it's very important to, to be able to have a lot of those personal connections. Right. Listen, Jeremy, it is always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, again, Mazal Tov on uh, the, the appointment of Naftali Bennett and uh, your new role, or old role, new role, doing the same things, but... Uh, I'm doing the same things, but I'm a lot more popular this week. <laughs> Good way to put it. Well, listen, Bats Thank, Thank you, you very Adam. much. I'm looking Big forward. Pleasure. Everyone, I hope you enjoyed uh, the wonderful insight we're getting here from Jeremy, political uh, strategist. And I'm just signing off from uh, the eternal and ancestral homeland of the Jewish people here in our undivided capital, Jerusalem. Thanks for watching. Shalom, everyone.